Dad's in choir at church, and he has a friend who tells him this story. A friend has traveled abroad, I think it was Turkey, but I'm not entirely, I don't entirely, entirely remember. And Dad's friend meets someone in Turkey, they're chatting, the fellow says, uh, where are you from? Dad's friend says, United States. His uh, person he's talking to says, oh, where? Oregon. The person says, oh, where in Oregon? My dad's friend is like, I guarantee you, you have never heard of this place. The guy's like, try me. And my dad's friend says, Tangent. And the guy's like, oh, I've been to Tangent. The guy's like, I'm in the grass seed business. If you're in the grass seed business, you know about Tangent, Oregon. So that is an illustration of how no matter where you are, it is very likely that you will interface with the global economy at some point in your career. So today we're gonna to talk about writing for that international audience, uh, which also means writing for a cross-cultural audience because um, there are more cultures than just the culture of one country and another. All of us are living in multiple cultures all the time. If you live in Sweet Home, you live in a different culture than if you live in Albany. If you live in my neighborhood, you live in a different culture than if you live in uh, the big houses over in North Albany. If you work at Walmart, you are working in a different culture than if you work at um, the little frame shop downtown. So we're gonna talk about writing for that global audience. And before we get going, I'm gonna tell you just a, a little story about my family, since uh, A, it kind of relates, and B, you're, you're a captive audience, except for my online students who can always turn off the video. Um, and I suppose you are also always free to, to leave. I'm not the boss of you. But, um, but anyways, I've got you. It relates, and you all shared such interesting things about yourself in your introductory email. So I wanna share a little bit about myself. Um, so I am, my mother is a war refugee. She's from a little country called Estonia, which I've got up here. Um, to give you a sense of, of where it's at, like here's France, here's Germany, um, and there's Estonia, way up there. Little tiny country that kept getting invaded and taken over by everyone. This one came in and took it over, and then this one took it from that one, and that one took it from that one. Um, during World War II, my family decided that they had to leave. Uh, the Soviet Union was moving in, and they were killing or imprisoning people who had education. So they were seen as a threat to the government at the time. So my grandma was the very first female doctor in Estonia, and my grandfather was an engineer, so they were it was not good for them. So they fled the country um, under torpedo fire on a little fishing boat, and somehow they made their way to Germany where they lived in refugee camps. And this is, you may, you, you may have heard the term white privilege. People talk about white privilege. It's, it's, it's what you get because you're white, but you might not get otherwise. And we often think about that here locally, but I think about it for myself because I think about those refugee camps. Now the German, this was World War II, so perhaps metaphorically, perhaps literally down the street were the concentration camps and people were being killed in thousands, millions. The German refugee camps where my family was housed were not bad. The Germans were trying to do their best. I mean, these were not, it was not posh. It was four people to a room. You know, each family got one room, concrete floor, roof over their head, almost enough food. But, you know, it, it was not that bad. Um, and Germany supported the Estonians, took them in, uh, rescued them, did their best to provide housing and food for them because, um, Estonians are, are very, very white. We are Aryans. Uh, this, we were the perfect people to Nazi German, Germany. Uh, my wife is black and we often joke that I am where white came from because I'm 
Estonia. Estonia is very, very white. So I think about that when people talk about white privilege, I'm like, wow, I would never be if my family hadn't been white. My family had been brown, Jewish, um, gay, they probably would have been killed. As it was, the same folks who were killing other people were doing their best to house my family. Uh, but it wasn't great, and my family wanted to emigrate, and the choices were American and Australia, so I almost ended up in Australia, but somehow at the last minute they changed it to the United States. And that was because back then there was a, a program or system set up where a church could adopt a family of refugees. So there was a church down in California, and they decided they would like to have uh, an Estonian family. And so they collected money for their Estonian family, and you had to provide the family a job when they got there and housing, so they did. And uh, there was a pamphlet, which I still have. I didn't bring it today because it's so precious to me, I, I, I worry about losing it. But it's a little pamphlet, and it is, it is an advertisement for giving money to have Estonian, to support your Estonian family. It's like those Save the Children things, and like, oh, you know, these poor Estonians, oh, they just want to escape. And if you just give a little bit of money, then you can help bring them to America and live the American dream. The picture of the family, like the sample Estonian family, was my family. And I have the picture on my G drive, so I'm gonna show you the picture. So this was, here, I'm gonna turn the lights down a little bit. This was my family. They were on the pamphlet. Wouldn't you want to adopt that family? It was a really pretty family. This is my mother, grandfather, uncle, uh, grandmother, and uncle's best friend. So um, there they are. They came to this country. Now, this is just a side note. This is gratuitous. This has nothing to do with the class. But um, my grandmother was, the, actually, she was one of the first two female doctors in Estonia. And I have her graduation picture, which I'd love to share with you because it's just a fascinating artifact of history and culture. And it really illustrates how at least at that time, uh, there, was a, there was a different culture in Estonia than we have here. But the picture contains a dead body. So if you feel like that might upset you, and just, just, you know, just look down. You know, if you're like this, you won't see it. So I'm going to show you the dead body. So this is my grandmother here, and this is the other first woman, Dr. Estonia. And this is their graduation picture. And as you can see, they are posing behind a desiccated corpse. I just want you to think about that. Every graduation picture you have seen from America, how if someone posed a graduation picture with a dead body in front of the graduates, how freaking weird that would be. It would be on BuzzFeed, it would be on the New York Times, it'd be like, what the heck? But in Estonia, that's, this is an example of what you've been doing for the last couple of years. And another thing that I think is so interesting about this picture, Estonians never smile in photographs. And if you see photos of me as a little kid, um, I was not taught to smile in pictures. So I look like this most serious like child in the world, like these staring eyes and like super, super serious. And you see, uh, none of the Estonians are smiling or really looking at the camera, except for my grandmother, who's, who's looking at it. She's got just a little bit of a smile. She was also, incidentally, a guerrilla fighter, um, fighting against the the uh, Soviet um, invasion. So she was one tough lady. Um, if you were looking down, you can look up now. Oops. There's my email. I should check it more often. Um, okay, turn the lights back on. Um, so today we're going to talk about idioms, which are expressions that make sense in one language or culture, but maybe not in another. And they're things that you can't necessarily translate. So a couple from Estonia, Besi um, Gesabget means the hand washes the hand, and it means 
I do a favor for you, you do a favor for me. Uh, another one is Yahaniki uh, lights, which means literally, it's good it went that way. Uh, but the Estonians are, at least my mother's generation, they are, they are resilient, pessimistic people. Like things are gonna go wrong for Estonians. They have been invaded over and over and over again. Actually, Estonia right now is supposed to be a really uh, forward moving uh, and, and wonderful country to live in, but historically, bad times. So it means uh, it's good things went that way, but you only say it after something bad happens. So, um, and it means kind of like it could have been worse. So I think about the Modest Mouse song, the dashboard melted, but we still had the radio. We still had the radio, yeehaw, Nicky lights. Good, it went that way. And then one which is really useful, we, I don't think we really have this in, a, in a American English, you'll do, which means the closest I can get for a translation is you go girl. And it means, I see that you're about to do really good work. Yes, you. I'm not going to help you. So if someone's like, I'm about to go clean the rotten leaves out of the gutter. You'll do. Yeah, clean those leaves. I'm not getting up on that ladder and putting my hands in that disgustingness. So when we are writing, we want to think about international audiences because there are people who will not understand our idioms and there are people in different cultures or like right here in the United States who will not share idioms. Idioms that make sense in Lebanon but don't make sense in New York City. Um, and I love idioms. They're wonderful, they're colorful, they show us something about ourselves and our culture. But when writing technical writing, we want to try and avoid them. So I thought of a couple, you know, that I like from my friends. Um, uh, he lives in Snake Up Your Creek, meaning way out there. Or a friend of mine will say, oh, the cheese slid off his cracker. Uh, and then there's some that we're not as, we don't recognize them as idioms quite as much, like pushback. Oh, don't give me any pushback. Or he went over the top. Or I faked my way in there. Uh, those are also idioms that might not make sense if you're outside of this culture. And we have, we love sports. He hit a home run, he's way out in outfield, um, we lost that game, and we want to avoid idioms. We've got Urban Dictionary, like you can look up an idiom, but it's hard to look them up constantly, and there may be idioms that don't sound like idioms. So the Estonian says, yeah, maybe lights, it's good, it went that way, and the other person's like, wait, no, no, it was a major fail. What do you mean it was good it went that way? Because they don't know it's an idiom. And then we've got idioms that are so subtle. Forgive me while I swear. He's a shit. We don't like him. He's a jerk. He's the, he's the shit. We like him. He's awesome. Like how subtle is that? A and the, which basically mean the same thing. It's hard. So we want to avoid those. Uh, kind of things. Now, uh, thank you so much for filming, Claire. Goodbye.